part of being a human being, living in human society, is that you get domesticated. You learn how to live in your family, you learn how to live with the people around you in the neighborhood. There are certain rules, some of which are spoken, some of which are unspoken, that you learn how to follow. And some of those rules may be wise, and some of them can be very unwise. And a lot of us come to meditation from having suffered from the unwise rules. When we come here, we find that the rules are different. Out in society, the, the trade-off is that you play by the rules and you get protection from other people. They look after you in different ways. But here the basic rule is you'll have to learn how to look after yourself. Toward the end of the Buddha's life, he would repeat a teaching many times, that, telling people they had to be an island to themselves. And they did that by establishing mindfulness. Mindfulness of what? Oh, re re remembering to stay with the body, say, in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. The whole shebang, the whole formula. It's not just being aware of the present moment. Mindfulness is remembering. Basically what you're remembering is the Buddha's rules. One, skillful qualities, i.e. things Qualities of the mind that don't harm anybody should be developed. Qualities that are harmful should be abandoned. And the harm means not harming yourself or other people. This is very different from the rules of society, some of which ask you to harm yourself as part of the trade-off. But the Buddha says that it's possible to find a happiness where there's no harm to anybody. And then, of course, there are the duties of the Four Noble Truths to comprehend suffering, abandon its cause, realize cessation of suffering, and develop the path. Again, which are very different from the rules and duties that the world around you places on you. So as you engage with the world, engage with your family, people around you, especially outside of the monastery, you have to remember you're playing by different rules. And they're not going to like it. They've got a particular game in mind that they're playing. They expect you to know the rules and play by them. There's going to be some friction when you don't. But then the question is the people you depend on around you. How far can you depend on them? I think I've mentioned that when I was in Thailand, I would stay at a monastery where they had cremations. And one of the customs in Thailand is that when somebody dies, often a book is printed, either a Dharma book or a book about some topic that the, the dead person liked when he or she was alive. And there'd be a little biography at the beginning. I found the biographies fascinating, but there was always a part where they would say, well, as they, this person got older, traces of this disease began to show themselves. And at first the doctors were able to help, but then there came the point where the doctors couldn't help anymore. So the question, of course, is when you get to that point where the doctors can't help anymore, what are you going to do then? What are you going to depend on? It's not, that not just the doctors who can't help. Nobody around you can help. The people who love you, the people who care for you, the people you've been associated with, there are pains inside that they can't help you with. There's suffering inside that they can't help you with. So the Buddha is offering you tools to deal with that. And you're playing by different rules. And when you play by these rules, you're making an island for yourself, a place of protection. You're above the flood. But there's going to be resistance. So you have to be really confident in what you're doing. And remember, we're doing this so that we can find true happiness that's not going to harm anybody. The people complain about the fact that you're not playing along with their games. They're not being harmed by what you're doing. It's just that they, they have certain expectations. And you're saying no for your own protection and for the good of that other person.
So create an island for yourself. Stay with the breath. And the whole point of using mindfulness as your protection is that you remember the duties that the Buddha assigned. If anything unskillful comes up in the mind, you're going to try to abandon it. And he gives you techniques and recommendations for how to do that. And you want to remember those things. It's all too easy when you find yourself in a different company. That you remember their rules and you start forgetting the rules that the Buddha laid down. But this is if you're going to find happiness, this is how it's done. And his rules are not arbitrary, it's simply things that he observed. This is what works. There are a lot of things out there that don't work. So you take the breath as your refuge, as a way of reminding yourself to be alert here in the present moment, because this is where skillful and unskillful qualities arise. And as for influences coming in from outside, think of the breath as your shield. Get good at filling the body with your breath, to good breath, and filling the body with your awareness. If you occupy your space, nobody else can invade. Again, that's one of the rules of society, is that in order to understand people, you open yourself to their energy. This is one of those unspoken rules. Some people are extremely good at sensing the energy of other people. But then they find themselves invaded. And there are people who take advantage of the ones who like to be open to other people's energy as, as a kind of way of showing sympathy. But you're not playing those games. And you can see perfectly well what's going on in the other person if you're not open, letting their energy into you. In fact, you can see things a lot more clearly. Because you're there, right in the present moment. The other person is has a mind that's all over the place. You're the one occupying the present, so that puts you in a position of power. But again, you're not going to abuse that power. You're trying to use your inner power to figure out what's the most skillful thing to say, most skillful thing to do, most skillful thing to think right now. Then you'll learn to associate the Buddhist teachings with your breath, as long as you stay anchored with the breath. That's your conduit to what you've learned about how to comprehend suffering, how to abandon its cause. It's like your mind is lots, has lots of file drawers, and if you stay with the breath, you're in the open spot where you can access all of them. If you're running around to the past and future, you can't access these drawers. And so when you're still and with the breath, not only do you remember things better, but you're also in a better position to come up with new solutions, if none of the old solutions are working. So this is how you create an island for yourself. Because human society is like a flood. No matter what pleasures it promises us, there comes a point where it can't withstand aging, illness, death. Try as people might. You read about those people up in Silicon Valley who've decided they don't want to die, as if that were something new. But they also feel they have the right not to die. They're going to end up dying, and they're not going to be prepared. Here we're preparing ourselves. There will be death, there will be aging, and all that. No, see, the way to solve those problems is not to not get ill or not die. You solve those problems by looking at the mind. Why is it the mind creates suffering around these things? Where is the clinging? All too often you hear it said that the Buddha said, you know, life is suffering, which is not a very useful message. You're saying clinging is suffering. That's useful. That's something you can do something about. And it gives you the tools. It's important simply that you don't forget them. All too often in the, the heat of the moment, you switch back to the old rules. 
the old ways of interacting. This is what mindfulness is for us, to say, no, we've got new rules. Rules that make sense, rules that actually, if you stick by them, will lead you to a true happiness. Take you to something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. These are rules for your own good, your own true well-being. Which is why they should take priority over the rules of society at large. Because their rules are for what? To keep society going. But they're not necessarily for the good of the individuals. Here are some rules that are good for you as an individual, in a way that you can find your own true goodness, your own true happiness, in a way that doesn't harm anybody, doesn't inflict anything on anyone. People may not like it, may not be happy, but it's not harming them. That idea that's floating around a lot right now is that if you say things to people they don't like or feel offended by, you're harming them. That's a very dangerous idea. Again, that's another one of those ways of trying to domesticate people. You've got to do things my way, they say, without really thinking about what are the long-term consequences of my way. Your response is, okay, I'm, I'm trying things the Buddha's way, because the Buddha's way has been tested. It's been found to work. As long as the Buddha's way is followed, then nobody gets harmed. Which is why it's for everyone's benefit. So when you're dealing with the world, it is kind of like a culture clash. And you're in some cases you're acting as if you were undomesticated. But nobody gets harmed that way. So learn to put up with a little bit of friction and put a Thai smile on your face with moderation. I think I've told you about the time when my older brother was trying to give me some advice on how to run a monastery. And of course he has no experience running monasteries. So I smiled. He said, stop giving me that Thai smile. So use the Thai smile in moderation. And have lots of compassion for everybody, because a lot of people are following the rules that they learned from other people. And they're not really benefiting from them, but that's all they know. Sometimes you can help, and sometimes you can't. But the clash or the areas where the different rules don't fit is going to be normal. It's to be expected. But as the Buddha said, when you're protecting yourself through mindfulness, you're also protecting others. Remember the image of the acrobats. As long as you don't lose your balance, or as long as you maintain your balance, you make it easier for other people to maintain theirs. And one of those skillful qualities the Buddha recommends, some of them are equanimity, patience, goodwill. All good things. It's just that as he explains them and he recommends that you follow them, it doesn't quite fit with other people's ideas of what goodwill may be. But who are you going to trust? We've trusted society at large for who knows how many lifetimes. It's time to give the Buddha a try.